Listen to Go Fact Yourself, the new weekly trivia show from LAist. Hosts Helen Hong and J. Keith Van Stratton. That's me. Quiz celebrities on what they love. Saturdays at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. and Sundays at 8 p.m. Or anytime on the LAist app. LAist and Show and Tell present an evening with David Sedaris. The writer, humorist, and radio contributor will take the stage Saturday, November 16th at the United Theater on Broadway. Tickets and information at LAist.com slash events. Good morning, it's Air Talk. I'm Larry Mantle. Wonderful to have you with us. And I remind you every day because I'm still so impressed with all that's there on our voter game plan, where we've seen hundreds of thousands of people here in Southern California go to get in-depth information about the California ballot propositions, about local measures such as Measure G in Los Angeles County, which would expand the size of the Board of Supervisors and create a countywide elected position of chief executive. So many other of these important measures you want the details, please visit our voter game plan. It's at LAist.com slash vote. That's LAist.com slash vote. You'll also find all of the interviews that we've done on AirTalk. We've taken all of the statewide ballot propositions and some of the county white ones as well. We've had debates between uh, the respective interest groups for and against those those propositions and measures. You'll hear those on the voter game plan. They're nested under each of the of the measures or props themselves and our candidate interviews you'll hear there, as well as our in-depth conversations with the two L.A. County district attorneys, candidates, George Gascon, the incumbent, and Nathan Hockman, the challenger. We've got that as well under the D a description of what's involved with that race. Continuing in a political theme, we're so pleased to have with us from NPR, Ron Elving, who joins us regularly to talk about the biggest political developments uh, nationally and also to drill down to some of our local races. Good morning, Ron. Great to have you with us. Always glad to be with you, Larry. So let's talk about where things stand right now in in some of these Senate and House races across the country. Um, We anticipated record expenditures as both parties are looking to gain dominance in in the respective houses. Um, Where does that stand? We are seeing an extraordinary amount of money spent on this election already, a billion and a half. Uh, It will be far, far more. Uh, This is all the consequence of a Supreme Court decision a little over a decade ago that said you really can't limit how much independent expenditure is made by people who are private individuals. And so we have opened the floodgates, uh, not only to large amounts of corporate money, but also to even larger amounts of individual money from people who are willing to spend without uh, without looking back. Uh, When you bring in a person like Elon Musk, uh, obviously, (laughs) the floodgates are open. Well, and and at this point, I I keep hearing you know most of the prognosticators saying the odds are for Republicans to take the, the Senate from from Democrats, but for Democrats to flip the House. And just from what you've seen to this point, is is there any other sort of momentum than that? Well, let's just say that in the Senate, there really is no true majority right now. There are forty nine Republicans and forty eight. Democrats, one fewer. But there are three independents who caucus with the Democrats, and that allows them to organize the chamber and call themselves the majority. But it's really not a true majority for the Democrats there. They pretty much kissed goodbye to the West Virginia seat of Joe Manchin, who became an independent and is now retiring. And they pretty much had to say that John Tester looks like a goner in Montana. He's down substantially, and despite being a a re-elected incumbent, He looks like he's just not going to be able to stem the Trump tide in Montana, where Trump wins by double digits big time. So if those two seats go, the Democrats are actually down to 46 seats uh, with one less independent caucusing with them. And uh, that's going to make it real tough unless they can win some seats back. They're hoping to win in Texas. But, you know, we've all thought before Ted Cruz was going to meet his match, but uh, I don't know. Maybe Colin Ronald Red will get it done this year. He's a former Dallas Cowboys linebacker, and he's a solid Democrat and African American candidate, and he might get it done. But otherwise, it doesn't look likely the Democrats pick up a seat anywhere in the country. So just those two losses would cost them the majority in the Senate. The House, on the other hand, 
the question really should come back to you, Larry, because it's really all about California. <laughs> and yeah. to a somewhat less degree, it's all about New York. I mean, California's already 40 Democrats to just 12 Republicans. But it could get a lot worse for the GOP because they've got several of their people, one, two, three, four, who could, uh, who could lose, and a couple of others who aren't safe. Well, and, and let's take a look at some of those races. We have the 27th Congressional District in California. This is in northern Los Angeles County. It takes in communities like the high desert of Lancaster and Palmdale, along with the Santa Clarita Valley. And here we see the incumbent Republican Mike Garcia being challenged by George Whitesides, getting a tremendous amount of financial support from the Democratic Party. He's a former aerospace executive um, with Virgin, and um, he's putting up a, a fierce campaign. If you're seeing the ads that are on social media and on television, particularly around sports and news, they are are just absolutely everywhere. This a very hotly contested race, Ron. Yes, absolutely, and we should note that that is one of several districts in California that actually has a Democratic majority in terms of. Uh, most all of its other voting activity for other offices. It's considered a Democratic plus four by the voting indexes that we keep here in Washington. So uh, Mike Garcia, who is the incumbent Republican elected uh, several years ago, he's been serving for the last four years. uh, He's from Santa Clarita, and he has uh, survived in 2022. That was a pretty good Republican year. But uh, this is going to be a much tougher test with the much larger turnout that we expect in uh, in 2024 and so we will see if he can hang on in the face of all that media but you're really right to bring up social media because so much of the house contest you know you can't really buy enough television to cover southern california unless you're a statewide candidate or a presidential candidate but you can get all over social media you can get all over local radio And that's what's happening in the 27th. And that seat that Garcia holds actually had previously been held by a Democratic uh, member of the House. So that is the seat that has flipped in the past. Uh, Looking in Orange County, we've got the seat that is currently held by Irvine Democrat Katie Porter, who, of course, ran for U.S. Senate. Uh, She did not get into the final two runoff. It was Adam Schiff and Steve Garvey, the Democrat and Republican, respectively, who face off on November 3rd. Fifth, but the candidates to succeed Porter are Republican Scott Baugh, who's a very familiar figure in Orange County Republican Party. In fact, he was the former head of the Republican Party in Orange County. He's been a frequent guest with us on Air Talk. We interviewed him. You can hear that interview as part of our voter game plan. And current State Senator Dave Min, the Democrat from Irvine. Uh, we also have our interview with Senator Min. You can find on our voter game plan. This of a, a very contentious race, and um, it is one, of course, that has a Democrat currently representing it, Ron, but Republicans feel with, you know, with Baugh's name recognition that this can be competitive for them. Perhaps they can take it back. Uh, This is expected to be a tight race. This is one of those races that, to some degree, the House is resting upon. Now, I think it's fair to say that uh, most prognosticators here in Washington expect this seat to stay Democratic. It's still in the lean Democratic category for most of the folks that uh, do this for a living here in Washington and nationally, uh, the handicappers, if you will. Uh, But, uh, you know, just because Charlie Cook is convinced that that can stay Democratic, I've mentioned Charlie because he's one of the best known of these longtime handicappers. Mm. And just because he's convinced that he puts it in a lean Democratic category, that doesn't mean by any means that it's safe. And this is one that Democrats can ill afford to give back. You know, and I wonder what the factor is going to be. You know, we've got a ballot proposition here that rolls back a number of the criminal justice reforms of Prop 47 passed by voters about a decade ago. Um, I don't have a sense of how much that might drive more conservative voters to come out to the polls, whether that would make a difference in this Orange County race. But in the aftermath of this election, I think that's going to be a fascinating thing to look at, Ron, with the polling of people who voted. Uh, To what extent the ballot props got them out? That's right. Well, in many states, of course, Democrats are hoping that ballot propositions having to do with abortion will bring out every last person who has ever considered being a Democrat or considered voting for a Democratic candidate, and that that will save them in places like Arizona and possibly Florida 
and that that will uh, contribute to their showing there. But you're right, in California, it could very well go the other direction. Now, among conservative Republicans, oftentimes it doesn't take much to get them to the polls. They have a fortress mentality for many years of feeling that they are the minority party in California, and so they do tend to turn out even without a proposition. But if there's something hot like that, to bring over the less committed voters, the people who have been more recently come to think of themselves as a Republican, uh, that group could make the difference there. The 40th Congressional District, currently represented by uh, Congresswoman Michelle Steele, and then uh, the Democratic challenger is Derek Tran. This is a district where Democrats hold a five percentage point registration advantage, but uh, more than a fifth of uh, the registered voters in this district are no party preference. So we'll have to see what happens in in that race. And uh, we've got others like in the Inland Empire and Coachella Valley, the incumbent Ken Calvert facing a strong challenge from Democrat Will Rollins. You've probably seen all the ads all over Southern California TV and social media. Number of Central Valley races as well, uh, like David Valadayo trying to hold on to his seat in Hanford the Republican from Rudy Salas Jr.'s Democratic Challenge. Ron, thanks so much. We look forward to checking in with you again very soon on the upcoming big election. Thanks so much. Thank you, Larry. Always a pleasure. Thanks. That's Ron Elving joining us from NPR, where he regularly takes part in our conversations on politics. He's senior editor and correspondent. If you want to stay engaged with your world wherever you are and whatever you're doing, count on us. We're LAist anytime, anywhere. LAist and Show and Tell present An Evening with David Sedaris. The humorist, comedian, author, and radio contributor will take the stage at the United Theater on Broadway to share insights, read from both published and unpublished work, and host a live Q&A with the audience, followed by a book signing. It's Saturday, November 16th at the United Theater. Tickets and information at LAist.com slash events. Nearly 2,400 Southern California Kaiser mental health workers went on strike yesterday. It's day two of their job action. Joining us to talk about what their demands are and what the effect has been on mental health care for uh, Kaiser recipients is Robert Garova, L.A.'s mental health reporter. Robert, good morning. Thanks very much. Hi, morning, Larry. Uh, So share with us uh, what are the issues of dispute in the job action by the uh, psychology workers at Kaiser? Well, I was on the picket line uh, yesterday in Los Angeles at Kaiser's big medical center there on Sunset, and I heard, you know, therapists uh, say what I've been hearing, you know, leading up to the strike as well, which is, um, you know, many people are seeing 10 to 18 patients a day. They feel like they're on an assembly line, not not able to provide um, sufficient care to their clients. Uh, so one of the things that they're, they also say they're burnt out. They're very tired, and, and they're seeing a large amount of turnover in, in their view. But um one of the things they're fighting for in this contract is seven hours a week of protected time so that they can do things outside of appointments, uh, like uh, you know follow up with emails, uh, fill out patient charts, things like that, because they feel like there's not enough time in back-to-back appointments to be able to, to get everything that they need to, to, to do done. And then, of course, there's um, you know they're also fighting for better uh, wages, um, getting a restoration of a more traditional pension plan. Um, you know, Kaiser, we should note, uh, has said that uh, right now on the table they have an 18% wage increase over the next four years. So that's kind of the gist of where things are. And I think I read in your piece, Robert, that they've offered six hours a week of protected time to do charts and things like that. Yeah, although it seems like f- four hours would be protected, but they're offering okay. six. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 18% over four years four protected hours, up to six hours a week for doing the other parts of the job to document their work and, and whatnot. And do we know how much of how many of these sessions are done via telehealth versus in person? 
That's a good question. I imagine it's it's still a, a fairly large percentage, but uh, I, I don't have that from from the union at the moment. Because that helped to know kind of what their workload, because because the workload obviously is going to be different depending on whether it's in person or or telehealth. And as as you write at las dot com, uh, Kaiser has been on a bit of a hiring spree, but that's been followed by heavy turnover. Yeah, I talked with a researcher who's worked with the National Union of he- Healthcare Workers for a long time now. Um, you know, he said that they. they They've looked at the data, and over the last uh, few years, Kaiser has hired more than 1,500 therapists, which he said, in in his view, was great. Um, But uh, one in four of those are already gone. Um, and when you talk to the the mental health workers, they say, you know, their colleagues are, are dropping left and right. Uh, one thing the researcher brought up that he heard uh, from a, a patient was, you know, um, this particular individual had, had gone through three therapists in one year because two of them had quit. Um, and, you know, he said that's that's not a good standard of care. As you can imagine, you know, you, you need to work, build up time with your therapist. They need to have that therapeutic alliance with you. And that takes time. And if, you know, people are being shifted around or quitting, it doesn't um, doesn't work out. Well, and, and the other thing is there are so many places now looking for mental health workers that it's a very competitive job environment, too. And I wonder if one of the issues that Kaiser is facing is um, that they're being bid against by other entities because every there just are not enough people, psychologists, social workers, you know, people trained to do this work to handle the caseloads pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing that uh, across the board, really. I don't think anybody would say that that it's easy to hire mental health workers right now. Definitely, you know, the L.A. County Department of Mental Health has had a big struggle over the years uh, trying to fill fill spots. And, um, you know, they've brought in incentives and, and um, you know, uh, money up front and stuff like that to, to incentivize people to come into the field. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's not just Kaiser in that respect. So it seemed, you know, one of the challenges here, because the mental health professionals, Robert, are talking about burnout, their caseloads being too high, if Kaiser is in this this jam where everybody else is trying to hire people and just simply can't hire enough people to make humane caseloads for the workers. You know, this is a difficult circumstance because the demands are understandable by the workers, but also Kaiser's competing against everybody else for a finite pool. And and I just wonder, you know, if, has that been at all a part of this conversation, do you know? Um. I haven't heard that as as much uh, from Kaiser. Um, you know, I, I again, I, I do think it's a huge issue. Um, you know, I I think what you're hearing from the therapists is, uh, you know, they they feel like they're on too much of an assembly line. They can't catch a breath um, in between. And yeah, maybe that's part of the hiring. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point they feel like they're, they're not able to give the care that, that they want to give. Well, and, and undoubtedly their feeling is if the wages are higher, if people are paid more, that's going to attract more people to come into work for Kaiser and give them a break on the caseload in the long term. Yeah. And that's, well, that is one of the arguments from the, the union is that, uh, you know, they want to be paid on par with, uh, you know, physical health therapists, you know, uh, radiation therapists, you know, they, they bring up as part of their argument. Um, you know, they say those the, the mental health side has not um, kept up, you know, and mental health parity in general is, is still a, a national conversation. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that particular argument comes up a lot. We're talking about the job action that's been taken by approximately 2,400 Kaiser Permanente mental health workers here in Southern California. They started picketing yesterday, uh, saying that uh, they want to see the turnover diminish. They want patient care improved. They want lower caseloads. They're looking at uh, higher salary for the work that they're doing and better job conditions. And as uh, Robert mentioned, um, the protected time to be able to do the things beyond face-to-face therapy that uh, that mental health professionals have to do at Kaiser Permanente. Um, do we have a sense, Robert, of, of how many more people are seeking mental health care at Kaiser? Because coming out of the pandemic, it just seems like so many more Americans are dealing with mental health challenges and are seeking care. Yeah, I, I think that's an issue. I think, um, 
you know, uh, there's been some good reporting recently. Networks in in general, not just Kaiser, are having a problem keeping their um, their list of available providers up. And I think a lot of that is uh, up to date. And I think you know a lot of that is exacerbated by the fact that you do have more people reaching out. You know, I know from from my personal family experience, it it has been a struggle to find care in that in that um, you know in the mental health field, and I think a lot of people feel that. Um, so you know, it's it's not just Kaiser struggling with that. I, I'd love to hear from Air Talk listeners if you are covered by Kaiser as your healthcare provider and you get mental health services. What's your experience been? I I welcome your input on this. We're at eight six six eight nine three five seven two two. That's eight six six eight nine three five seven two two. You can also email us with uh, what your experience has been. Robert mentioned a person that he spoke with who said uh, they had three different therapists so far this year because of the turnover at Kaiser uh, and the difficulty, of course, when you've laid the foundation and you're doing longer-term therapy with someone, then to have uh, the professional go and you have to start from ground zero with the next one. Maybe they have your case file, but it's it's not the same, of course. So I'd be interested in hearing your experience. 866-893-5722 or you can email us at atcomments at laist.com. Please include your location and first name. Kaiser had a major strike with its Northern California operation uh, fairly recently, didn't they, Robert? Yes, uh, that was back in 2022. And, um, you know, in that situation, they did get, uh, you know, uh, win better wages. Part of the argument with the Southern California workers is they're looking to the North and they're saying, well, you know, they have this amount of time protected. They they won that in their contract. Uh, we want that, too, so we can provide better care in, in their in their mind. You know, in comparing those, you know, what, what we might see from what we saw in Northern California strike was, um, you know, the number of uh, appointments canceled. Um, one of the things the union has brought up is that there's more than 100,000 uh, appointments canceled, you know, affecting tens of thousands of um, of, of Kaiser members. And, uh, you know, one thing the union wants to make clear, and Kaiser says that they're very much on top of it, is making sure that, you know, there's a continuity of care that, uh, you know, just because the work stoppage happens doesn't mean that even if an, if an appointment is canceled, you know, Kaiser has to step in and make sure that someone else steps in to, to take care of it even while the strike is going on. So, so that may what be a managerial person or do they ever refer outside the Kaiser system? Uh, of course, that can be tough to get an appointment. Yeah, but I mean, they, they do that now. Uh, I think Kaiser mentioned that um, I think 60 percent of their their mental health um, in, you know, network is is not directly employed by them right now. So these are the 2,400 on the books who Kaiser people. Who are direct people. Kaiser yeah. employees, yeah. not people within the network who were referred to under right. contract. Right. Right. All right. So there is that opportunity. But again, even there, the challenge is, and particularly if someone's dealing with acute uh, distress, uh, dealing with uh, depression, bipolar, a variety of things, and are in uh, you know, a media crisis, this can be challenging. Let, let's take um, a call. This comes from Anne in Huntington Beach. Anne, good to have you with us. Just real briefly, please, your experience as a Kaiser member. Hi, good morning. Um, my experience as a Kaiser member, as far as the mental health side, has actually been pretty depressing because in less than two years, I have gone through four therapists due to them being so overbooked that it would be four to six weeks between appointments. I wouldn't get to see them very much. And then a few months after we start, they would either leave the field entirely or go accept work somewhere else, and it's gotten to the point where the mental health blow I take from starting and then having to find another one is worse than not having a therapist at all, and so I'm about ready to give up on finding a long-term therapist. Oh, Anne, I'm so sorry. I mean, it's just... 
uh, painful to hear that. And, uh, I mean, going weeks in between, it's got to be hard to even recall where you were in talking about things, even if you have the same therapist in the follow-up appointment. And thank you for sharing that experience. And Liz and your Belinda said, a colleague of mine many years ago left uh, County Mental Health to work for Kaiser because they paid more. They came back a few weeks later because of the heavy caseloads. They could only see patients that were considered suicidal every three weeks. This is not a new problem at Kaiser. That's Liz in your Belinda. Liz and Ann, thank you both very much. Robert Grova, thank you. We'll look forward to your continuing coverage of this, and we'll hopefully this can be resolved uh, in shorter order than the one in Northern California. That lasted 10 weeks. Yeah, thanks, Larry. All right. Robert Grova, who covers mental health for us at LAist 89.3 and LAist.com. This week on Imperfect Paradise, our investigation into millions of dollars of COVID relief money in Orange County that remain unaccounted for. We break down what we know about the fraud allegations surrounding the 23-year-old daughter of OC supervisor Andrew Doe and the nonprofit Viet America Society. On Imperfect Paradise, wherever you get your podcasts. Well, there are a lot of things that are spooky about Halloween, but this year, chocolate prices are truly scary. We have seen chocolate go through the roof, and there are a number of different factors that are at play. You won't be surprised to know that the supply being uh, much more restricted is, is one of the biggest ones. But to talk us through what's happening in the world of chocolate and the candies made from chocolate is from The Ohio State University Assistant Professor of Agricultural, Environmental and Developmental Economics, Alexis Viasis. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Viasis, for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, so let's talk about the shortage of chocolate. What's driving that? Hey, Larry, thank you for having me. Indeed, chocolate prices have increased. And this is primarily due to skyrocketing costs of the main ingredients, which are cocoa beans and sugar. So while sugar prices have risen steadily, the most dramatic shift has been in cocoa, which has experienced a staggering 300% price increase in 2024 alone. And this wow. is due to a combination of many factors, and including, for example, climate disruptions in West Africa, speculation in the cocoa futures markets, and a rising global demand. So all these factors combined at the end of the day mean higher costs for chocolate producers, and inevitably that trickles down to us, chocolate lovers. And uh, where is, is most? where are most of the cocoa beans grown in the world? Well, most of the world's cocoa comes from West Africa, specifically from Ivory Coast and Ghana, which combined produce around 60% of the global supply. So the thing is that these countries have faced severe climate shocks, including droughts and heavy rainfall, which are driven mostly by the El Nino phenomenon. And these extreme conditions have fostered plant diseases, diminished crop yields, and coupled with aging plantations, production has been severely impacted. So they need high humidity and, and, and they're going through this drought period. You also mentioned global uh, rise in demand. How much of that is growing affluence and interest in chocolate in some, some parts of the world? And how much of it is um, dark chocolates um, growing popularity with the view that it has healthful properties to it? Yes. So in addition to the climate shocks they already discussed, on the market side, we have really interesting developments. So, for example, cocoa is traded in the futures market in New York and in London. So, of course, there is a lot of speculation in these markets, which help to drive prices higher. We have a global demand for chocolate that continues to rise. And then the, this global demand for chocolate has never been fully met by the supply. So we have countries which increasing incomes like China or countries like Qatar or Saudi Arabia, which are heavily increasing the chocolate consumption, and this put more pressure in the chocolate value chain. All right. Uh, and, Professor, let, let's talk about what this means in terms of retail sales of chocolate candies. Is that full 300% increase in cocoa being passed along to the consumer? Yes. Big 
companies like Hershey's, Mondelez, Nestle, they all are taking action. So as cost rise due to these cocoa shortages and increased demand, these companies are making adjustments. So some are passing costs to consumers by reducing the size of products while keeping prices stable, what we know now as shrinkflation. Other companies are also introducing new, more affordable products that probably have less content of cocoa. So this will allow consumers to keep producing chocolate, but at the same time, they will be consuming less chocolate. Is this uh, a boon for lesser known brands of chocolate that have typically uh, priced their products under those of, of the major companies like Hershey's and Mars? Do, do, do that, they now maybe get more business? Yes, I mean, there, there are many factors that will be at play in what we call the big four seasons or the candy buying holidays. That includes Halloween, Valentine's Day, Easter, and the winter holidays. So prices is the most dominant factor when purchasing candies. And what we have seen is shifts in the behavior of people. People are buying less frequently. They are sticking to smaller pack sizes. And they are mostly choosing products that are on sale. But people are also looking at alternatives. For example, in this specific season, people could be looking at gummy candies or lollipops, which do not heavily depend on cocoa. So these type of alternatives can become more popular, especially for people that are looking for budget alternatives uh, that, that are very friendly to their pocket. It sounds, though, uh, as you were saying, that even sugar, though not as big a rise as cocoa, that sugar's gone up. So even those might be more expensive this year. Yes, yes. But that, that that's part of the normal market cycle. We have seen a normal increase in prices of commodities, but not as much as cocoa, as you mentioned. We're talking with professor at Ohio State University, Alexis Viasis, who's the assistant professor of agricultural, environmental, and developmental economics, talking with us about what's happened to the price of cocoa, uh, therefore what that means for the price of chocolate Halloween candy, uh, talking about the weather conditions in West Africa where there's been significant drought and uh, a need for a lot of precipitation there for the growth of, of cocoa. And professor, with climate change, does it open up some other regions that might be getting warmer and more humid to become cocoa-growing regions? Yes, yes. So all this present uh, very exciting opportunities for, example, regions here within the U.S. Here in the U.S., we produce cocoa in Hawaii and in Puerto Rico. And these shortages in big producing countries in West Africa represents opportunities to promote cocoa production in different regions around the world. What we have seen in the last decade is a rise in other important cocoa producing countries like Ecuador and Indonesia, who are almost taking over Ghana and Ivory Coast in terms of production. And what are the environmental effects of, of cultivating cocoa? Does it often lead to deforestation to do the cocoa plantings? Yes. Sadly, deforestation is one of the major environmental challenges tied to cocoa production, and this is particularly in West Africa. Cocoa farming has been a significant driver of forest loss as farmers, they need to clear land to increase cocoa production. But the thing is that this not only affects biodiversity, but also contributes to climate change at the same time which ironically makes cocoa farming even more difficult due to the changing weather patterns. Professor, thank you so much for joining us and explaining what's happening with chocolate prices. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Larry. That's Professor Viasis of Ohio State University. It's Air Talk on LAS. We now are going to go to Orange County. The U.S. Attorney's Office has a news conference going right now. I'm on the board. The public corruption scheme that we announced today spanned a long period of time, 2020 through this year. To carry out this scheme, Mr. Doe used his authority as a county supervisor to steer $9.3 million in funds that were meant for COVID relief to an organization known as Viet America Society, or VAS. This was a purported nonprofit. The money was paid to Viet America Society through various contracts from mid-2020 through 2023. While steering these funds, federal and state COVID funds, to Viet America Society, Mr. Doe did not disclose that one of the leaders of this group was his daughter, Rhiannon Doe. 
The $9.3 million that was sent to Viet American Society was meant to pay for meals to older adults and people with disabilities. Mr. Doe made sure the money went to this group, and that was the bulk of the relief money that Mr. Doe was tasked with distributing. In doing so, Mr. Doe publicly touted the meals program as a benefit to his constituents. He was featured in videos saying that the organization was providing 2,700 meals per week to the needy. That was not true. In fact, of the $9.3 million that was sent to Viet America Society to provide meals to the poor, only 15% was used for that purpose. The rest was stolen and used for bribes. Let me tell you how the bribes worked. Shortly after receiving its first payment from the county, <clears throat> Viet America Society began directing money to Mr. Doe's daughters. They did this through indirect payments. They would send money to vendors, which were purportedly providing services, but in fact helping to facilitate bribe payments to Mr. Doe's family. These vendors included an air conditioning company and a restaurant. In total, Mr. Doe and his family received over $700,000 in bribe payments. When a public official engages in this sort of egregious misconduct, we all lose. Mr. Doe was put in office to champion the needs of his constituents. The hardworking people of his district deserved honest representation, but that's not what they got. Instead, they got a politician who put his own needs above those of the people in his community. Mr. Doe was an example of the American dream. He came to this country, he worked hard, he achieved success, he was elected to public office, and he threw it all away to enrich himself and his family. Perhaps most tragic in this entire case is the fact that the people he stole from, the money he took, was meant for those who are most vulnerable in our community. With this case, we are now taking a major step towards justice and accountability. Mr. Doe has, a plead guilty, has agreed to plead guilty to a count of conspiracy to commit bribery. That count carries a statutory <clears throat> maximum sentence of five years in federal prison. He's also agreed to resign today from the Board of Supervisors for the County of Orange. In addition, we seized through the investigation over $2.4 million, and Mr. Doe has agreed to forfeit that money. Mr. Doe has also agreed to forfeit any interest in two properties purchased using this money, including a property in Tustin that was the source of bribe payments and put in the name of his daughter, Rihanna Doe, and a property in Santa Ana. Finally, as to Rihanna Doe, she has entered a diversion agreement in which she admits to engaging in criminal misconduct and agrees to cooperate in this investigation, which I should say remains and is ongoing in exchange for not being prosecuted criminally in this case. Let me conclude. As you've repeatedly seen, my office is committed to rooting out corruption throughout our district. The public is entitled to officials who operate honestly and faithfully. That didn't happen in this case. My office and our partners, local and federal law enforcement, are committed to making sure we combat corruption in all its forms. I want to give thanks where thanks is due for this case. First and foremost, I want to thank the Orange County District Attorney's Office for its work here. This was a joint investigation with the Orange County District Attorney's Office. Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer is here to my right, and his attorneys in his office, I cross-designated as Special Assistant United States Attorneys, worked tirelessly on this investigation. Our agencies joined forces to investigate and prosecute this matter so that Mr. Doe could swiftly be brought to justice. That partnership has brought about this result we announced today. I also want to thank the federal law enforcement agencies who joined us in this investigation. That includes the FBI, who helped lead this investigation, and the support we received from the IRS, FDIC, Officer Inspector General, and the Department of Education, Office of Inspector General. Finally, let me give appreciation and thanks to the prosecution team that helped bring about this result and will move forward this ongoing investigation. That includes Assistant United States Attorneys, Charles Pell, Bradley Merritt, and also Tara Van Ver, 
and also Deputy District Attorneys and Cross-Designated Special Assistant United <coughs> States Attorneys Avery Harrison, Anshali Thiener, and L.J. Berger. I will now uh, bring to the podium District Attorney Todd Spitzer. You're listening to the U.S. Attorney for the Central District of California, Martin Estrada, talking about the charges against uh, now First resigning all, Orange like County Supervisor uh, Andrew Doe. United Del. States Attorney Martin Estrada for his phenomenal leadership and the message he's conveyed consistently throughout our region and his jurisdiction that political corruption will not be tolerated. I'm extremely proud of the work of the United States attorneys that have already been introduced and the fact that three of my prosecutors from the Orange County District Attorney's Office have been allowed to be cross-designated as special federal prosecutors for the purpose of this investigation and prosecution. While millions of Americans were dying from COVID, Orange County Supervisor Andrew Doe was the fox guarding the hen house. He raided millions in federal pandemic relief funds and orchestrated the money intended to feed the elderly and ailing residents to instead fill the pockets of insiders, himself, and his loved ones, his family members. From a Vietnamese refugee who came here with a Pan-American bag and a bunch of dictionaries in different languages because he did not know where his family would land after the fall of Saigon. Supervisor Doe, with all his experience and his education, concocted a public persona of a hometown hero who had achieved the American dream and was guiding his constituents through the uncertainty and fear of a global pandemic. His dream of America has now become a nightmare for Orange County taxpayers as greed and arrogance replaced the public servant that he had portrayed himself to be. While local governments across the nation were trying to save lives, federal relief dollars came flooding in from both the Trump and the Biden administration creating the perfect opportunity for a money grab while no one was watching. The conspiracy was born, and soon Supervisor Doe was robbing the taxpayers blind, literally stealing taxpayer dollars out of the mouths of the most vulnerable Orange County residents during our most vulnerable time, a worldwide pandemic. Instead of food, Precious taxpayers were spent buying a $1 million home for his youngest daughter, Rhiannon, providing bribe payments to both of his adult daughters, paying American Express bills, paying his own property taxes on two different homes that he owned, one in Westminster and one in North Tustin. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in federal relief money was withdrawn from ATMs in cash. Meanwhile, those who needed the relief went without. No one is above the law in Orange County. And the U.S. Attorney and I, along with our federal partners, refused to allow any elected official to violate the trust of the voters that have given the authority to them to watch over their hard-earned taxpayer dollars. This joint investigation and the resulting prosecutions would not be possible without our partnership. Corruption of any kind will not be tolerated. And these charges should serve as a very powerful warning to all elected officials that their actions have consequences and justice will be swift and justice will be decided. Decisive, excuse me. Today's plea agreements represent the first Orange County conviction of an Orange County supervisor in 50 years. And that's why it is such a dark cloud today. As public servants, we are stewards of public safety as well as public dollars. Many of you know I'm a former Orange County supervisor who sat on that board for 12 years. And now as the elected district attorney, it was critical for us 
to make this case quick and decisive to stop taxpayer dollars from continuing to be pilfered and to ensure that Supervisor Doe agreed that the taxpayers will not be on the hook for his county pension that he accrued while engaging in this criminal conduct and that his resignation will stop his salary and benefits immediately. This was all going on while he was bragging publicly about providing, because of his leadership, 2,700 meals a day. Yet the elderly were dying. The elderly were starving. The elderly didn't know they were going to get their last meal. They didn't know if they were going to lose their homes. They didn't know whether they could see the sunrise come up tomorrow. And yet, through this deceptive and complicated web, Supervisor Doe benefited personally. This is why you'll see when you get the documents in a side agreement with my office, I've demanded that Supervisor Doe resign immediately. And I also demanded, and he agreed and signed, that he would forfeit his pension that he had accrued since June of 2020 when the conspiracy began. I was elected in 1996, my first time to the Board of Supervisors, in the wake of the Orange County bankruptcy. And when we ran for office as supervisors, we committed to helping the county recover and be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. I'm literally incensed and quite frankly disgusted that when this money flowed in from the federal government, that Supervisor Doe, selfishly and in concert with other people, did everything he could to benefit while other people were crying out for help. That to me is disgusting. This investigation is far from over. And rest assured, neither myself or the U.S. Attorney and his team will rest until we hold everyone responsible in this conspiracy accountable and that we recover every possible taxpayer dollar that is still outstanding that was literally stolen out of the mouths of our most vulnerable residents. At this time, I'd like to introduce special agent in charge, Ted Dox. You're listening to Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer, this live coverage news conference at the Reagan Courthouse in Santa Ana. My name is Ted Dox, special agent in charge of FBI Los Angeles' criminal division. Corrupt acts by any elected public official undermines all citizens to whom they serve. These public officials have a responsibility to implement programs and policies that will benefit all people. Their role is not to squander money, solicit bribes, or to steer funds to organizations or persons wherein a coordinated effort allows those funds to make their way to family members or friends. When actions like these occur, the integrity of local, state, and federal government is severely tarnished. Public officials conducting illegal acts destroys the reputation of all elected officials, many of whom serve in their positions honestly, and it also erodes the trust and confidence of citizens representing their communities. And when citizens lose trust in governments, this diminishes our democratic society in which we cherish. Today's plea is another exclamation point to the FBI's commitment to ensuring that local, state and federally elected public officials perform their duties with honesty, integrity, and commitment to all constituents in which they serve. Anyone with information about public corruption should report it directly to the FBI by calling 1-800-CALL-FBI or electronically by going online to tips.fbi.gov. Our commitment to hold corrupt public officials accountable is steadfast and we will continue to protect citizens in our communities who depend on us. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Acting Special Agent in Charge, Linda Nguyen from IRS. That was Ted Dox, FBI Special Agent in Charge. We're talking about what's come out of the investigation of Orange County Supervisor Andrew Doe. This is live. Good morning. I am Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Linda Nguyen, from IRS Criminal Investigation, Los Angeles uh, Field Office. Combating public corruption is one of the most important roles federal law enforcement agencies play in our local communities. Andrew Doe, in his elected position as an Orange County Supervisor, 
was entrusted to ensure taxpayer dollars were used responsibly and for the intended purposes. Instead, at a time when his constituents needed the most during the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Doe exploited his position on the Orange County Board of Supervisors to influence and channel the funds to close associates of the Viet America Society. In addition, accepting bribes that, went and used, that were used to purchase homes, pay property taxes, and even pay fictitious income to his family members. Unfortunately for Mr. Doe, financial transactions leave a paper trail. IRS criminal investigation is the best in the world at finding and following those leads. And along with some great work by our investigative partners, we were able to find the proof of where and how those funds were spent. The selfish and negligent actions demonstrated by Mr. Doe violated not only the trust in placed in him by the public, but also the trust in placed in him by the federal, state, and county governments. Mr. Doe will be now be held accountable for his actions. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Martin Estrada. That's IRS criminal investigating action special agent in charge, Linda Nguyen. Spanish, and then we'll do uh, Q&A. Buenos dias. Mi nombre es Martín Estrada. We'll go back for the question and answer momentarily, but just uh, let me update you to what we're listening to. It's a live news conference at the Reagan Federal Building in Santa Ana, where we heard from the U.S. Attorney for the Central District of California, Martín Estrada, that Orange County Supervisor Andrew Doe has agreed to plead guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit bribery concerning programs receiving federal funds. His plea agreement has been filed today. He's expected to make an initial appearance in federal court in Santa Ana later this month. Uh, Doe agreed to plead guilty to a felony federal charge for accepting more than $550,000 in bribes for directing and voting in favor of more than $10 million in COVID funds to a charity affiliated with one of his daughters, Rhiannon Doe. Part of this agreement is that Rhiannon Doe will not be prosecuted. She has agreed to a diversion program in exchange for cooperating with prosecutors in the case. As we just heard from District Attorney Todd Spitzer of Orange County, uh, Andrew Doe has agreed to immediately resign his supervisorial seat. He's termed out uh, in the coming months, but he will leave that seat immediately. Uh, Doe admitted in exchange for more than $550,000 in bribes going back to 2020, he voted in favor of and directed millions of dollars in COVID funds to the Viet America Society, a charity affiliated with his daughter. Doe directed and worked together with other county employees to approve contracts with and payments to that nonprofit. Doe further admitted to federal authorities that he acted corruptly and abused his position of trust as a county supervisor. We're still hearing the uh, Spanish translation of the uh, charges and the agreement that's been reached. Again, we will be going to reporters' questions momentarily. U.S. Attorney Martina Estrada said by putting his own interests over those of his constituents, uh, Doe sold his high office and betrayed the public's trust. Even worse, the money he misappropriated and accepted as bribe payments was taken from those most in need, older adults and disabled residents. Uh, Martin Estrada said, our community deserved much better. Corruption has no place in our politics, and my office will continue to hold accountable officials who cheat the public. Both Estrada and Spitzer, the DA, said that the investigation into Doe's activities are continuing, even with his agreement to plead guilty uh, to this count. Uh, um, involving conspiracy. And, uh, by the way, there is a maximum five-year federal prison term that's attached to this. We, we don't know yet what, as part of the plea agreement, will be the actual sentence to the supervisor. 
Uh, Doe admitted that um, there this was a scheme where bribes were paid to companies uh, that were allegedly providing um, services uh, for uh, properties and and for the nonprofit involved, and that that money then uh, was in fact going to uh, the supervisor and to family members. Uh, that that money was being pocketed instead of going uh, for the actual service that were being contracted for. Uh, so we're, we're going to be going back, getting reporters' questions in a moment. Let's take a very brief break. We'll continue with more on Air Talk. LAist consistently delivers important news to Los Angeles and Orange County. Hi, I'm Ellie Yu, senior reporter at LAist. I started reporting on nursing homes at the height of the pandemic. Our investigations found a loophole in state law that allowed nursing homes to operate without first getting licenses. And later, we found that people with serious mental illness were funneled into facilities that weren't set up to care for them. Our reporting on nursing homes has caught the attention of legislators who've since changed multiple state laws. LAist, connecting you to your community. We'll be uh, talking with our reporter, Nick Gerda, who broke this story for LAist and has been at the forefront of all the developments all the way along. Nick is going to be checking in with us and we'll be getting additional details. Back to uh, the news conference with questions from journalists on scene. To one of his other daughters. What, what did it happen with the, with the uh, seat, with Joe's seat now? Someone was talking over you. Can you repeat your question? What's going to happen with Andrew Joe's seat on the Board of Supervisors now? Will it remain empty? Or... That, that is certainly not my role. Our role is to enforce the law and ensure accountability for public corruption. Does Mr. Christopher know? Yes, sir. Can you talk about the, the range of penalties that go along with um, the crime that he pleading guilty to? Yes, he is pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit bribery. Uh, that charge carries a five-year statutory maximum sentence. When the sentencing occurs, the court will consider all the factors present, the aggravating factors, the mitigating factors, to determine the appropriate sentence. Can you talk about how you came up with the bribery charge? Was there an explicit quid pro quo, maybe you found in a text message, um, or were there email exchanges, or was it just from testimony of witnesses? Can you talk about how you came about to you know, learn the, kind of the, the, the bribery part of it? Well, the, we traced the money, and we saw that we had a politician who's sending millions and millions of dollars to one particular organization. We saw services not being provided. And then we saw those monies being diverted into other companies, purported vendors, and then that money being directed to Mr. Doe's daughters. Can you clarify, once again, the $700,000 he received in bribe payments, but he agreed to pay back $2.4 million? Can you just clarify those two numbers? Sure. So we determined through this investigation that he received uh, through his family, approximately $700,000 in bribe payments. This included monthly payments from some of those vendors, the air conditioning company, the restaurant, that were paid to the daughters. This also included a lump sum payment of about $360,000 that was used as a down payment for a $1 million home in Tustin, California. In total, that amount in terms of bribe payments was uh, over $700,000. Now. The scheme involved far more money that was stolen from taxpayers, as we described. We traced $2.4 million from misappropriated funds. To the extent that Mr. Doe has any interest in that money, he has agreed to forfeit any of that interest. Did his daughter, is there additional money his daughter is accused of stealing uh, in this scheme? Is the $700,000 inclusive of what his daughter took, or is that in addition? The $700,000 includes all the bribe payments we've been able to trace to Mr. Doe and his family. Yes. Yes, this, I'm uh, from Phobo <clears throat> Sa TV, a Vietnamese community uh, media. Uh, you said that the um, investigation going on uh, when it in, uh, cooperate. So will it be involve the uh, vendors, the restaurants, the other receivers of the money, and the other elected officials uh, usually uh, working together? We will pursue every angle of this conspiracy. As I mentioned earlier, this was a very sophisticated conspiracy involving money going to different vendors, different entities. We will pursue all those leads. As you can see, we've got the joint forces of my office, the Orange County District Attorney's Office, federal law enforcement, FBI, IRS, Department of Education, uh, FDIC. This will be a comprehensive, fully investigated matter. Uh, can we talk about 
to you about this. Mr. Doar, I believe, was in the OCDA's office, correct? And I don't know the timing of all of this. <clears throat> Mr. Doe, in his career, had been both a public defender for Orange County as well as a deputy district attorney. I can't tell you the exact years, Michelle. So can you comment on um, just the fact that here we have a sitting supervisor who is now admitted to this and, and a man who was charged with upholding the law here in Orange County as, as one of our DAs? Well, I think Mr. Estrada and I have said the same thing um, several times in different ways. Um, it is incredibly disappointing and um, unfathomable that somebody with that much power, influence, the positions he's held, would take that position of trust during our country's most vulnerable time, when his citizens were dying when they needed meals, when they weren't sure where their next meal was coming from, that he instead feigned that there was 2,700 meals a week, put out a video to satisfy the public, hide the ball over there, while he was simultaneously funneling money to uh, his daughters and bank accounts for personal use. That it, 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 it's just unfathomable, and as we, started to dig in with my team and the U.S. Attorney's team, and then we joined forces. Um, what we put together, which we've talked about today, um, is quite frankly, I, I think people, I think the community is, is shocked and overwhelmed and surprised because um, you take people in positions of trust that I've held and Mr. Estrada has held and many standing up here, uh, we are stewards of the public trust. And Mr. Doe unequivocally broke the trust of the public. Was there a grand jury investigation taught as well? I'm not at liberty to discuss the convening of grand juries. Those are confidential proceedings. Um, so I'm not allowed to comment about that. Was all this money from the discretionary fund? And can you, for former supervisor, can you talk about is it too easy or can you how easy is it for him to direct this money to another agency like this without any oversight? Does he have free will to do what he wants with this discretionary fund? Well, so, Chip, there was multiple funds. There, the board during COVID, each supervisorial district of the five, allocated roughly about $10 million in discretionary funds that did not require when it was going to be allocated any public vote or putting on a public agenda at the Board of Supervisors. That was a horrible mistake by the board and the County of Orange. That lack of oversight uh, is, is, is unbelievable. And it obviously came back to haunt the actions of what Supervisor Doe did to the county. There were other monies, though, that were allocated as well, some from the CEO's office, another contract with VAS, um, that went on as well. But that did not involve the board, it, except for a vote. So there was a combination of discretionary monies and then monies that came through and were approved by the Board of Supervisors. Fair to say most of it was from the discretionary fund? It's fair to say it's real a lot this these monies were commingled over a period of several years. So tracing the discretionary, the dough money from the county money that got board approval, you can go through and the accountants and others forensically have gone through and done the tracing of these monies. But the fact of the matter is, irrespective of the color of the money, whether it was voted on by the board or discretionary, it's all green. And it and it was funneled into inappropriate uses. And that's the key. Whether it was discretionary is irrelevant in terms of the misuse of it. It's all green for purposes of the criminality. I have one more question. Yes, question. My question is, you know, we forgot about you play the supervisor living. You play civil living in the west of the city. But the searching from the FBI and RS, why don't have anybody served you know, his house in the West Beach? Okay, that, this is all, all part of, as you heard Mr. Estrada and I say repeatedly, this is on an ongoing investigation. We are absolutely committed, as you can tell by our pronouncements today, to ensuring that there's justice. I want to publicly apologize to you as the district attorney and elected official representing 3.3 million people in this county that what has happened with the Vietnam Memorial in Miles Square Park is an absolute shame. I am very, very, very apologetic. Our Vietnam vets deserve 
to have these things built and rely on it, just like our veterans cemetery. I'm very sorry, sir, that this has occurred in your community. And I think I'll close my comments. I'm sure Mr. Estrada would want to uh, uh, say something to close and end this event. That's what this is all about. It is the absolute miscarriage of justice for projects and programs that people need, that people rely on, that, people's, that people, whether it's through starvation or medical care or understanding that they'll have something recognizing their service in the military. We have the largest population of Vietnamese Americans living outside of the country of Vietnam here in Orange County. The Vietnamese community is a proud community. It's an honest community. It's a stand-up community. And Mr. Doe emerged out of the flames of the fall of Saigon to become a leader of the community. And he completely betrayed that trust. And that's why we're here today, to do justice for your community and all taxpayers. OK, thank you very much. The uh, press release is out. We will have a Vietnamese language. You've been listening to a live news conference from the Reagan Federal Building in Santa Ana. With U.S. Attorney Martina Estrada, you were just hearing uh, that lengthy answer to a couple of reporters' questions from Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer himself, a former Orange County supervisor. There was also a, an FBI representative, an IRS criminal investigation representative who spoke during the course of this news conference. Uh, I just want to uh, quickly talk with Nick Gerda, correspondent who broke this story. Everything you've just heard over the past four minutes is the direct result of the reporting that he and his colleagues have done here at LAS. But Nick, first of all, is your head kind of spinning by this? That I mean, this this is what this has all led to? It is. This is definitely not what I first thought this, this would turn into when I first started looking into these funds. This is a stunning development, um, very sobering moment for Orange County. Um, you hear a lot of discussion by the district attorney and the, the federal prosecutor of, of a, a feeling of betray betrayal of trust and that very vulnerable people um, you know, were, in their, in their view, harmed by what Supervisor Doe did. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really stunning moment. Um, it sort of, uh, in, a, in a sense, um, confirms the worst concerns that I had as I was starting to look into these records and piecing together the money that we were able to, to look into. Um, but very grateful for the support I've had at, at, here at LAist to have spent the time diving into that because it, it has been a, an enormous undertaking, um, thousands of documents we've gone through. Um, but it just, we, we've kept at it. We, we kept pursuing, following the money, asking questions, getting records, um, and um, we're seeing um, you know, more, more facts and truth come out today. It's astounding. We'll continue with Nick Gerda. By the way, his coverage, you're seeing new stuff come up at LAist.com because he's he's writing as we go. He's putting, he's working two things at once. He's talking with us, also posting at LAist.com. So throughout the day, you'll be able to see the coverage that he and the team working with him is producing at LAist.com. It's Go Fact Yourself, the weekly trivia show from LAist. Hosts Helen Hong and J. Keith Van Stratton, that's me, quiz the smartest celebrities we know and find out why they love what they love. Well, we've got the legendary George Clinton here. Anything else you'd like to ask or say oh, to him? Oh, it's such a thrill, and I've seen you in concert a number of times. This is such a great bonus to a great night. Tune in Saturdays at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. and Sundays at 8 p.m. or anytime on the LAist app. That's Go Fact Yourself. It's Air Talk on LA is 89.3. I'm Larry Mantle. It's a huge news day. We just aired live the news conference from Santa Ana, the Reagan Federal Building, where we heard from U.S. Attorney for the Central District of California, Martina Estrada, as well as Orange County DA Todd Spitzer, that Andrew Doe, with just a few months left in his term, is resigning. And do we have confirmation of that now, Nick Gerda? A new development here. I was just provided a copy of a, a resignation letter from Supervisor Doe. I've gotten this now. This is a source who sent this to me, and I've I've gotten it now confirmed uh, through official channels. And it's addressed to the chair of the Board of Supervisors and other top county staff. 
dated today uh, regarding resignation. It states, Dear Chairman Wagner, Ms. Aguirre, and Ms. Styler, kindly accept this letter as my notice of resignation as Orange County Supervisor, 1st District, effective immediately, uh, signed by Andrew Doe. And this is something that um, the U.S. Attorney Mar- uh, Martin Estrada was just mentioning what Supervisor Doe has, had agreed to do. And now we have, in, in black and white, his resignation letter effective immediately. So he will no longer be uh, the supervisor uh, for the 1st District in Orange County. Again, uh, just in case you just joined us, Nick Gerda, correspondent here at LAist, broke this story. It was a tip that he received that then took countless hours of investigation, requests for public documents, trying to find out uh, whether what was told to him was in fact true about money that was funneled through the supervisorial office of Andrew Doe to a nonprofit, Vietnam America Society, ostensibly to provide meals for people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the specifics in in this federal uh, charging document that we know about how much money was involved and where it really went? Yeah, so the U.S. attorney said that over $19 million uh, was at issue here uh, that was meant to feed seniors and provide services for needy people during the pandemic and that only, in his words, only 15% of those funds went to serve the needy. Uh, Much of the rest of the money um, was, according to the U.S. attorney, uh, used for bribes uh, to pay um, Supervisor Doe and his family members and diverted into, um, you know, basically his, his inner circle. And they said yeah. vendors were involved. There was, uh, I think he said, air conditioning company and restaurant that they say were, so they're apparently, they were, they were bogusly um, uh, being paid for services with that money then apparently being kicked back to the family. Yeah, I, I missed that part of the part of the press conference, maybe the, in the Q&A. But what we do know is that uh, for, from records we reviewed, a significant amount of the funds were uh, routed through the nonprofit VAS to a series of companies that were controlled and managed by the same people who ran the nonprofit. And that's where, um, it, from the county standpoint, they were unable to find out what ultimately was used with those funds because it was being forwarded to these other companies that were not just and there was not disclosure of what happened with with that money we we had been looking into ran and doe's home purchase she was 22 years old at the time last july when she bought a million dollar house in tustin and we we actually asked rhiannon about that back in uh, april and she gave some responses denying any wrongdoing around it but with that point we had noticed uh hundreds of thousands i think over a million dollars was being routed through the nonprofit to a series of companies connected to the people running the nonprofit, and one of those companies Rhiannon Doe was uh, a leader on, documented as a leader on, and, and um, she, you know, again, disputed any wrongdoing. But we, there were these signs in, in records that money had been sent places without explanation, and the, and the people controlling it ultimately were the same people at the nonprofit. And that's that was a, you know, kind of a, a, a red flag for us that some, was something to worth worth looking into and continuing to explore and try to piece together how uh, this 22 year old uh, full time law student afforded a million dollar house, including a four hundred thousand dollar down payment. We heard from the U.S. Attorney Martina Estrada that two properties have been forfeited as a part of this deal. Presumably, that house uh, under title to Rhiannon Doe was one of the two properties. I would, I think so. The way he described one of the properties is consistent with that home that Rhiannon Doe purchased. Um, but the scale, I mean, the scale of what is alleged here, um, and apparently there's a you know a guilty plea um, a- agreed to here, is um, unlike anything I have seen or heard of in Orange County um, in. Um, I I think decades. Um, the, super, the DA himself said this is the, f- the first time this something like this has happened in over 50 years in Orange County. So it's, it's just it's really unfathomable what we're looking at here. It's astonishing. You know, we've seen corruption with LA City Council members who've been um, sentenced to prison terms as a result of bribery. The convoluted nature of this, and um, for lack of a better term, the blatantness of this involving family members. I'm trying to think of anything in Southern California politics that would compare to this during the time I've been working. I, 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 I can't think of anything just given how the brazenness, I guess, is what I'm saying. This is this is really brazen. You know, you, you could hear in these um, uh, the prosecutors voice voices in anger about um, what what they say happened here. Um, uh, 
disgusted, I think was a word that supervisor, uh, sorry, former supervisor Todd Spitzer, now district attorney Todd Spitzer, who was one of Doe's colleagues previously to becoming uh, the, the DA in Orange County, uh, I think I think he used the word disgusted to describe this. And the U.S. attorney, um, Martin Estrada, said this is Robin Hood in reverse, um, that Mr. Doe and his co-conspirators stole money from the poor. Um, and um, yeah, so it's 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 really it's hard to imagine. The IRS representative um, said that uh, there was a you know basically there was a paper trail here that they were able to follow, and that's and that's something that's been um, that struck a lot of people I've talked to who followed our coverage on this is uh, this question of why um, people thought they would potentially get away with this um, because in this modern era there's bank records there's all sorts of um, ways to trace money and the IRS criminal division uh, has a very a strong reputation for being able to do that and so. Um, there's a lot, lot of questions to explore here of how we, we got here, um, yeah. how this happened. I thank you for all your hard work. That's Robin Valley Glenn. And that was addressed today by the U.S. attorney, the federal prosecutor. He said that they first started looking at this after seeing media reports, and we were the first uh, to publish several stories on this. That means you and your team, Nick. Thank you so much. Congratulations. We'll continue with you because there's much more to talk about. The level of detail in this release is extensive. I have so many more questions. I'm looking forward to asking Nick. We thank you for your support. I'm Frank Stoltz, the civics and democracy reporter at LAist. I'm here to help you understand what's at stake in the races for L.A. City Council and L.A. County District Attorney. To help you learn more about these elected seats, the candidates facing off, and the information you need to cast your vote, check out our Voter Game Plan, a guide to navigating your ballot and making your most informed vote. Visit LAist.com slash vote. And it's air talk over time. I'm Larry Mantle. I don't see any other way without a journalist like Nick paying attention to a tip and following it down this road. You never know what's going to come of it. You, you, you know, as Nick has said when I've talked with him about this before, you have no idea whether something's going to pan out. And it takes time to determine whether it will. But in this case, where there was smoke, there was, in fact, fire. And that conflagration was detailed in the news conference last hour, in case you just joined us. The U.S. Attorney's Office for Central California, the Orange County District Attorney, representatives of the FBI and the IRS Criminal Investigation Division, all with a joint news conference, laying out the case against Orange County Supervisor Andrew Doe, who has now resigned from his seat effective immediately, has agreed to pay back $700,000, which has been uh, received uh, ill-gotten gains uh, from the scheme, and uh, also two properties that have been forfeited. Nick is back, and he is uh, he's multitasking. <laughs> we yeah. say he's, he's he's back and forth with sources. He's posting at LAS dot com, and I encourage you to follow along because it's being updated minute by minute, and he's with us. Um, and yeah, we've got some new you know new things coming oh, great. out as okay. well. Okay, yeah, um, let's get the know, latest. For folks who are interested, we've got a statement now from uh, the other four members of the Orange County Board of Supervisors. I, they're actually in, I believe they're in their regular meeting oh, right really? now. Wow. Um, and I understand that there is a some kind of sign on Supervisor Doe's uh, chair or his placard that says the, uh, vacant or seat, the, noting that the seat is vacant. Um, the other board members, uh, Vicente Sarmiento, Supervisor Vicente Sarmiento, says this is a day Orange County residents have been waiting for to ensure Supervisor Doe is held to account for his misconduct. The unsealing of the indictments demonstrates years of unethical and illegal acts that directly harmed the most vulnerable in our county. We must not discontinue the investigations until all parties involved are brought to justice and the s- systemic problems that led to these abuses are reformed. End quote. Supervisor Katrina Foley, um, the other so it's Supervisor. Sarmiento and Foley have been from the beginning Very concerned critical. about this. The other yeah. two supervisors less less so. Um, but Foley says in a, in a statement, "I am disgusted." Quote: "I am disgusted by the staggering level of corruption, greed, and deception described in the unsealed federal indictment." Andrew Doe and his associates carried out an overt scheme to enrich themselves off our hard-earned tax dollars. Andrew Doe must pay for his crimes. This board is united in continuing to do the people's business of governing and moving forward from this dark day in Orange County, end quote. Rhiannon Doe, his daughter, who was the recipient, as laid out in the charges here, of much of, of the funds that, that uh, were channeled through bribery, um, she is apparently cooperating with investigators and is being 
put into a diversion program and apparently is is not going to be prosecuted on criminal charges. Yeah. So the language from the U.S. attorney was that Rhiannon Doe, Supervisor Doe's daughter, who's now 23 years old, uh, has entered a diversion agreement in which she has agreed to criminal misconduct and has agreed to cooperate in exchange for not being prosecuted criminally in this case. Um, and again, she's the one who purchased that million-dollar home that the federal uh, authorities say was was purchased uh, to a large extent with stolen funds that were meant to, to feed needy seniors. Can, can you reread because uh, the language? I was just curious about it. So it said admits to criminal – but is not being charged. That's interesting. So it's like making a public statement that I engaged in criminal activity, but you're not being prosecuted for the criminal at, activity. At this time, exactly. And what, okay. what we're seeing, a theme with a lot of federal uh, federal corruption um, prosecutions, including in Orange County in the last few, the last few years, is that um, typically there's these agreements that they reach where – the, the prosecutors say there are there are things we could charge you with. They sort of hold it over the heads of, of people uh, in exchange to get cooperation and continued cooperation. And we've seen um, there were some corruption uh, charges uh, and plea deals actually a, f- a couple years ago involving the, the then mayor of Anaheim um, and a prominent Democratic Party political consultant uh, where they pl- pleaded guilty. Um, but they still have not been sentenced and it's gone on for a couple years now. So, so there's this theme that um, – the feds want cooperation from people. They want to get to the bottom of the broader, uh, you know, story of who who was involved. If there were other crimes involving other people, um, to to continue to get cooperation from people. Uh, he's also agreed to forfeit his pension from June of 2020, which is when um, the the criminal activity began. So I guess he can keep his pension from pre-2020, but the deal with Todd Spitzer, he said, was as of June, when with the commencement of this activity from there on, uh, he would not get any pension ben- uh, benefit. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and that's in the timing of June 2020. That is when Supervisor Doe and the other board members, the Board of Supervisors, created this meals program in all, each of their districts. And originally it was a million dollars in each district. And eight days after that vote to create that program, Via America Society was created as a nonprofit. Um, so that, so there's an allegation by the county uh, previously that VAS was created as a vehicle to receive these funds. Uh, it was not an established organization previous to the creation of that meal program. And again, it was meant to serve uh, vulnerable people in Orange County who were struggling to access food, whether they were seniors or people with disabilities. And 15 percent, according to the U.S. attorney, did go for the stated purpose. But you had trouble actually documenting that. You saw some photos of people in a park or something, but but there weren't really documents about where what was spent and who got meals. Yeah. And in fact, this the nonprofit was required under their contract with the county to say in their monthly invoices how many meals they were serving. And they were not doing that for the first full year of the payments. Uh, they were getting $166,000 a month from the county for a full year without following that requirement to say the basics of how many how many services they were providing. And that's one of the kind of mysteries here that we are going to continue to, to look into is how the county allowed this to happen, why they were continuing to pay out these invoices when there were um, some, some issues, some violations of the con- – apparent violations of the contract from the beginning to say what they were doing with this, with this money and, and how many people they were serving. Um, I made a note during the news conference, Nick, that the U.S. attorney said $2.4 million is being forfeited. It wasn't clear to me whether the two properties are a part of that or whether they got accounts. Do you have any details on that? You know, I don't. Uh, there's There are some more details that have come out in like the plea agreement and other things. I haven't had a chance to go through that yet. We're just trying to keep up with the, yeah, you know, no, all the it's a fire hose. Yeah, it's yeah. a fire hose at this point. But so um, we should know later in the day that more of those details. It was also was not clear to me whether the properties fit into that $2.4 yeah. million or not. Um, and, and also, I mean, I think when you look at the numbers that were being given, uh, the, if they say 15, only 15 Fifteen percent of the nineteen point three million went to the services. That's in, that's that's in the but well above ten million that they say did not. And so I'd be interested to see how what what the investigators have found about that large scale of money that they say was diverted or not used for yeah, the purpose. Yeah, where did it go? Right, yeah. because what they've described as far as. Um, the term of the 2.4 million and these homes um, being being given back that does that doesn't account for the full scale of what they say. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have lost. to see what it, it sounds like. They're still in the midst of this. They said they're continuing the investigation. 
I'm amazed how quickly after the raiding of the homes, Doe's and, and his daughter Rhiannon's properties, that, I mean, that was just a few weeks ago, wasn't it? Like two months ago or something? Yeah, it was actually two months to the day. It was August wow. 22nd. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's there's things I've heard that I probably can't get into detail on about kind of how it led to this point. But um, suffice to say... I, you know, I think Supervisor Doe was was facing a lot of um, pressure to to take a deal. Uh, Nick, again, um, it's uh, it's extraordinary what you and your colleagues have done. I've I've been so impressed by your journalism, not just on this, but other things too. But seeing how this has all taken off, something so much bigger than anyone could have possibly imagined, and led to today's events. Again, congratulations on this important work, watchdogging government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Correspondent Nick Gerda with us on Air Talk. LAist consistently delivers important news to Los Angeles and Orange County. Hi, I'm Jill Replogle, the Orange County correspondent at LAist. The fire that broke out in Tustin last November at a World War II era military hangar spewed asbestos into the surrounding community. For months, neighbors had crews in hazmat suits combing their front and backyards to safely remove debris. When I couldn't get a straight answer on just how far and where the toxic material had spread, I requested public documents, and we produced the only publicly available map that tracked reports of how far the debris had spread, about 10 miles from where the massive hangar burned for weeks. LAist, connecting you to your community. 